Donny Brook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS. Thank you very much for joining us. My goodness, there have been some changes on the St. Louis landscape. We're going to talk about that. And on the second half of this program, we're going to be joined by Dr. Ness Sandoval from St. Louis University, taking a look at population trends in our area. Let's meet the panelists who are assembled for this edition of Donnybrook, starting with the news director for the Big 550 KTRS and the co-host of the Jennifer and Wendy Show, Wendy Weiss. He's one of our founders from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and today named by the readers of the Riverfront Times as the best journalist in St. Louis. Congratulations to Mr. Bill McClellan. And we have Mr. Ray Hartman from the Big 550 KTRS, host of St. Louis in the Know. He's also with RawStory.com and with the Riverfront Times. Ray. And we have Mr. Alvin Reed, the news editor for the St. Louis American, where he's also a sports columnist and recently won for the third time best sports columnist for a weekly newspaper from the Missouri Press Association. So the award-winning Alvin and Bill and uh, <laughs> my goodness, Alvin. Hey, since you're uh, such an award-winning sports columnist, we'll go to you on uh, news that Mike Schilt was canned today by the St. Louis Cardinals. I met him for the first time a couple of weeks ago. Maybe that was the kiss of death. <laughs> Can you think of any other reasons why he's no longer with the club? Well, I'll tell you, in my uh, brilliant uh, sports writing uh, career, when that popped up on the scroll, I saw Cardinals manager Mike Schilt and, like, looked down and thought to myself, we'll get contract extension. Who didn't know that was coming? Then I look up and it's like, he's fired. He's out of a job. <laughs> you know, um, uh, John Mazeliak, I guess, uh, president of baseball operations said philosophical differences. I think, you know, Plato and Socrates had philosophical differences. <laughs> Something happened. And it sounds like it happened at the end of season meeting that they all have, you know, right after you've been eliminated and you sit down and you say like, okay, this is where we want to go. What do you think? And I think there was a difference of opinion and I think there must have been sharp difference of opinion which led to his firing. I mean, this man was just fired. The Cardinals have no idea who they're going to hire. They don't know who's going to be available. The playoffs are still going on. And at this time, you can't even approach anybody about hiring them right. until after the World Series is over. This, something happened really fast. And this mm. is coming on the heels of a, a historic winning streak. Yes. I mean, they, they, were, they were eliminated by the Dodgers in the wild card race. But still, yeah. after a kind of a tepid season, they, they got there. And it sounds like, it does sound, it, frankly, it does sound like a meeting that went south. That they asked him to maybe get rid of a manager or two, mm -hmm. and he refused. I mean, that's the kind of, I think that's the kind of guy he is. I think he's very loyal, very plain spoken. Mm -hmm. And if push came to shove, he probably walked out. Well, I hope it's more than that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I mean this is, so sports is entertainment, and the Cardinals right. are an entertaining franchise. And I hope this isn't some... You know, well, he was just being a good guy and defending a coach. I hope that there's something juicier. Scandal. And, well, yeah. yeah, something, something scandalous. And, and, you know, I mean, you know, not criminal. I don't want to see Mr. Oh, Schultz go, go to prison or anything. <laughs> but, I, but I wanted to remember when Harry Carey yeah. uh, was a uh, hit and run in front yeah, of the right. chase party. Yeah. And, and people said it was because he was having an affair with Gussie Bush's wife. Uh, I mean, that's entertainment. Yeah, well, and, 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 and th that's spoken, the level I'd like to see this thing get to. Spoken like a Cub fan. No, and I, yeah. I think it's it. Yeah. You're, yeah. I, we don't know for sure if they don't have somebody in mind, but, but you, you know, I, I agree that, well, first of all, the guy was the manager of the year in 2019, first full year. And, and it may have something to do with the fact that I think I looked up, he's like 4 9 in the postseason. So maybe it was that. But when you talk about philosophical differences, it does beg a follow-up question. If you just say it's personnel, I'm not going to tell you. It's one thing. Right. If he, he was telling fans, all of whom have a philosophy about something with regard to baseball, you would think that, well, tell us what the philosophy, tell us about it. I mean, that's not really that right. confidential. Or tell us what the philosophical difference is. And you point out, I mean, he just had, not only did they just have the arguably as good a winning streak as who knows how long it could have gone had they needed to keep winning i mean they they stopped at 17 yeah. after to rest their players when they did when didn't need to win anymore and and imagine one of the manager's jobs is to keep the team focused here they are 500 at the beginning of september he did a decent job 
a no, good enough job. He didn't Clearly. lose his team. Let's put it that well, way. Well, we'll see what happens. So I, I don't, don't know. Forget, I don't, the Cardinals don't got rid of Joe Torre. Then he went to the Yankees, and he won four out of the next five World Series. And, and, so I, and we I wish will, Mike Schilt the best. Okay. Okay. I'll make the prediction. Let's, he will win. Where okay. He goes next. Uh, uh, let's yeah. hope so. And uh, also, I will also say, uh, ask not for whom the bell tolls. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, good old Ray Hartman. I want to ask you about um, the NFL lawsuit in the city. The city, for the second time in 20 years, is suing the NFL. We're kind of getting used to this. But now the legal pundits around this area are saying, you know what, St. Louis has a pretty good chance of winning this lawsuit. And now people are maybe counting their chickens even though they haven't been hatched yet. They're saying, okay, we might win $800 million in this settlement minus legal fees or maybe an expansion franchise for the city of St. Louis. If you had your druthers, which would you take? Well, I, I don't even know how to answer it because it's not, we're not getting an expansion <laughs> franchise. And I, I don't mean, look, I'm a sports fan. I'd love, as a sports fan, to see you have another NFL team. I'm, you know, no question about that. Um, I'm not sure it would even be the best thing for us because sports marketing, sports entertainment being what it is, a metropolitan area, not only our size, but with our shrinking corporate base, probably can't support three full three pro sports teams. Now, the fans can. That's what but, they said, though, no, when the they fans were here can. before they Well, left. but they didn't. I mean, you got to understand, when the, we left, the Rams were 31st in revenues and stuff. So the point is, I, that isn't really going to happen. Personally, I, as a fan, I'd rather have that. As a practical matter, hmm. I do think, I continue to think this is going to get settled. I have no idea what the money's going to be. But I think it's substantial okay. because the, the Rams, okay. the owners don't want to subject and themselves. Every, every franchise out there, including the Dallas Cowboys, is worth like $7 billion, cry poverty, okay? Be it baseball, hockey, whatever. I'm sorry. God bless you, Tom Stillman. I don't believe this will go broke if there's a football team in St. Louis. I was in Kansas City last weekend. Buffalo was there. The downtown, the people that were there from Buffalo fans, it was just, it was amazing. I do miss it. And if we had that chance to, uh, you know, to, to get a franchise, expansion, whatever, we should opt for that just over the lump sum. I will also say this, and, and I'm, I'm not really joking around here. There's a, there's a wild card out here, and it's the 650,000 emails that brought down John Gruden, and there's a lot of owners out there right now thinking They're of themselves. Um, there's emails that we sent in yeah. regard to this St. Louis situation that I do not want hitting the public, how do we get these people in St. Louis off of us? And if it came down to giving us an expansion team <laughs> or, hey, guess what you said, Jerry Jones, or guess what you said, Robert Kraft, <laughs> you'll never know it's, how that might work. It's, it's, the, the, I think but that a precedent it would I, set for them mm. to solve a problem with an expansion. This is not... They don't work that way, and I, these expansion franchises, first of all, most of them don't want to expand. They, they hitched their wagon to Stan Kroenke. They had to hitch, for whatever reason, they yeah. voluntarily hitched their wagon. Well, he would build the stadium on his own. Didn't ask for a dime. Right, right. But but I, I think that we will never be, this is just my opinion, I mean, the major league city that we have always been, there is something missing without an NFL franchise, True. without an NFL expansion. To, I think that would catapult us. I mean, obviously, we have a lot of things to address, um, but I, I texted Ben Fred this afternoon, uh, our contributor on KTRS and obviously your colleague at the Post-Dispatch, and he said, we're not paying attention to the nuts and bolts of the case. And he said, it's much easier to get carried away with all of this expansion talk. Um, but, but, and that the people who would be responsible for making these deals and decisions, they're not talking. You know, that these are all sure. just speculative. But but I agree with you, Alvin. Yeah. I, I say pull out every stop. Do whatever you can to get an expansion team. Okay. I don't trust. Yeah. I mean, how would the money I, I, be don't forget. Don't forget, everybody. Remember the um, NFL lawsuit back in the day, 20 years ago. Tom Eagleton was testifying right. Right. for the city and the county as we sued the NFL. And I think there are a lot of local cheer, cheerleaders who said, oh, this is really going to be good. And then all of a sudden, Judge Gene Hamilton dropped the case in the middle of the day, and everyone was surprised, and we went on our way. Who knows what's going on with well, this? Right, no, right. I understand Can that. I say something? I'm just saying Charlie. that. I'm, I'm just saying this, that. Okay. There's a lot of weirdness going on right now in regard to this trial, in regard to where the NFL stands, and 
Jeff Fisher's name got thrown into it, and the Rams got Michael thrown Sam. into it. Good thing. Yeah. 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 Okay, 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 let's hold, one, hold, one hold thing. that one, thought. Can I say because one thing? The, the expansion, this is a big cartel of hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars. When they expand, their piece gets less valuable. The only way they're going to expand the NFL is if it's going to bring more revenue in so their piece yeah. doesn't get smaller. I think they okay, are okay, not going to move on. Otherwise, we're not going to get to our topics. Sorry record. to be so rude, but we need to talk to Bill about your newspaper, which this week, I believe, is Josh Renaud. Yes, it is. If I'm pronouncing his name correctly, he investigated um, some of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education websites and found out that in the state of Missouri, there were the Social Security numbers of high school and grade school teachers, counselors, administrators that were accessible online. So your paper contacts DESE and the state government and says, look, this is not good, and didn't publish anything about it until it was corrected. And then today, the governor said that he was going to file criminal charges, if he could, against your newspaper for hacking into state government computers. I find this, I'm sorry, to be one of the most outrageous things I've ever heard out of Jefferson City, and we've heard a lot of outrageous things there. What do you say about this? Oh, yeah, I think the governor knows less about computers than I do. <laughs> and, and I have a flip phone. I mean, if he thinks that what Josh was doing, and Josh is a heck of a reporter and good on computers, was hacking, the first thing that shocked me was the de uh, head of DESE, uh, Dr. Margie Van, Van, Dieven. Van Dieven, who was a guest on the second half of our show <laughs> not that long ago. And I remember her from th then, I thought that some of her answers were very sketchy as far as the truth goes. But I thought, well, she's got an audience in Jefferson City. She depends on the legislators. And when that's her audience, your answers will be sketchy. But what she's done now is just beyond the pale. I mean, she just was completely dishonest about what Josh did. And, and I, I thought, uh, I don't know how she can keep her job, except this is Missouri. And she's obviously still playing to the legislators. And if the governor really wants to press charges against the Post-Dispatch, I think it would be a wonderful thing. I think it'd be good for the paper. Well, Republican State Representative Tony Lavasco, who apparently has a, a lot of software programming experience, he said, he, he was basically saying, I think that the governor has been misinformed. <laughs> you know, that, that, this is, that this was the furthest thing from hacking, that hackers usually don't warn the proprietor of the website that they have uh, you know that they have some kind of a mechanism that isn't working properly so uh, hopefully the governor unless he is planning on running against the media the press mm. the fourth estate as everybody does if this is part of his next campaign or an ongoing campaign I hope that he will maybe apologize well, because well, he well, I, you know, I thought yeah. the, the only criticism I would have of the newspaper is I thought it was too restrained in its coverage I mean, if, if I was the editor and uh, you wouldn't have waited. Dr. Van Dieven came out with this outlandish uh, explanation to cover herself blaming the paper, I would have put that in the lead. But the paper was so professional about it, yeah. ran the story, and you had to go to the jump I agree. to, to read well, right. the non nonsense I, but Josh, from Van I Dieven. agree. And yeah. what, what, what the Post was doing was a favor yeah. for the teachers were, yeah. and but those whose yeah. social they security numbers were accessible. There's completely some, above board. There's a different angle here, though. And what, first of all, it was really some of the best enterprising journalism the Post has done. And, you know, it's a, really solid. And, and, but the more outrageous than the fact that Parson is doing this is the fact that it's good politics. I don't know about it. that. Now, he's not running again. I mean, he's term limited out as governor. Oh, well, that's true. I don't know that he's running, but just in terms of the times Public we opinion. live in, a Republican governor going after the fake news media, the enemy of the people, at St. Louis's liberal newspaper, the only explanation That's pretty cynical, Ray. the only explanation for doing something this outrageous and irrational is that it may it plays now i'm not saying it should cuz it's horrible but it plays it well, might and, and, and this, I don't, is what, no. this is like okay watch this hand talking nonsense <laughs> right. cuz on this hand 
we've heard from our attorneys, <laughs> and all these teachers out here aren't suing the post dispatch. Right. They're, suing They're coming after us. us. Well, right, right, right. So we better spew some line. <laughs> That's there. right. It's, it's distracting. Just, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. But but it's, unless, unless, unless there's more to the story, that because what the, could the, be the, the post has been story? reporting on itself, and so you know there's an inherent bias there. Who knows? But. Based on everything we know, I think it's an outrage. And Wendy Weiss, I want to ask you about uh, St. Louis University. Our neighbor here in Grand Center had uh, been given all sorts of special tax benefits and also some zoning power when it came to what it called its signature development uh, for South St. Louis near Highway 44 on Grand. And as it turns out, to the dismay of some of the locals there, the signature development was going to be a is going to be a quick trip, uh, the sixth in a two mile radius, and some people are saying, "Wow, uh, St. Louis University, I think we're kind of expecting something a little different than a quick trip as part of your signature de development down there." How do you feel about a quick trip at 44 and Grand? Well, I, I feel I feel I feel for the urbanists who are concerned and fuming. Um, but these are very difficult times. And I say if you have a problem, then you should talk to the city that granted St. Louis University this, this leeway, this latitude uh, in, in 2017 and, and the power to, to give away these, these property tax breaks for what, 25 years? They've, they've got, I mean, that's, St. Louis University is a humongous part of, of Grand Center, this, the west end of the city. Um, a pandemic <laughs> has hit the world. Uh, the economic uh, forecast really crashed. So I do not, mm -hmm. I do not fault St. Louis University for, for doing what is best for St. Louis University. I'm sure that when things settle down a little bit, Maybe they will have a project that will delight the urbanists and, and others who are not happy at the moment, but they have to be realistic. And if, and if Quick Trip is making a significant contribution financially, then... Well, your generosity of spirit is great to see, Wendy. I mean, I thought, I thought it was awful myself. I mean, if they're supposed to, they're getting this latitude precisely so they can put in something special. And their idea of special is a quick trip. It's it a, just doesn't mesh. It's, it's a great headline, but I think that it is kind of cynical to think that they won't do something down the road. Well, if they get architects who design it to look like something other than a quick trip, and they fine, might. But if it looks exactly like every other quick trip, I think that there's going to be they a little nobody bit of, goes. It probably to. will look like every other quick trip. But I have to say this, okay? We were we did not come down here for what more than 18 months. And 19. three weeks ago, when I drove down and headed south on, uh, excuse me, headed north on Grand, boy, that drive had changed over those 18 months. And it was really impressive. And so I can't be mad because there's a quick trip at the corner of Grand and uh, I-44. I mean, what is supposed to go there? The art museum? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you guys, yeah. you're the being Guggen, a little... The Guggenheim, yeah, apparently, right. Alvin. Come the on. Guggenheim. Right. It, look, in the middle it's of a special pandemic. enough. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to leave Slew alone on this. Uh, no. And like you say, maybe across the street, down the street, the next time, something longer. Uh, uh, down the line is 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 more beautiful. How about a wine I, store? I think but, there's uh, that. Oh, oh, Charlie, no, Charlie there is but one how, element. There's uh, an it element has here. It's proven itself time and again to be very it's good. Corp I mean, very good sure. stewards. I hope they build you know a quick what? trip in your neighborhood and in I your house. One in my neighborhood. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't get Charlie. Where it's, at. I, it's at Big Ben and 44. Now, if it was in downtown Kirkwood, you might have a problem with it. But I mean, it's. At a thoroughfare and the highway. Well, I'll tell you what. Exactly. Tell the tourists Charlie, will love it. The tourists will speak, be coming here to Lambert Field so Charlie, they can see oh, our new development. That, I don't think Wait, that's what Slew had in mind. Speaking to too. that point, it's at a thoroughfare, okay? Yeah. And at some point, the city of St. Louis has to stop giving, has to start tailoring its tax breaks. If the idea of a tax break, which I think is great for St. Louis U, it's done so much for this town. Yes. But but it should be called back when it's a when it, for for a quick trip at a major intersection. Because that's not well, needed. But, but to be that's subsets. up to the but city I'll of St. You, Louis, Ray, to, get to on make one of my, sure that the, that those things are well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And, and they aren't doing that. Right. And by the way, St. Louis University is part of the arts to uh, 
the 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 the, the fund, yeah. the Arch to Park Equity Fund. That's the oh. profit-making arm of St. Louis Universe uh, of uh, Greater St. Louis Inc. And it comes back again to where are you? Who's getting the deals? And where? What are they doing mm. up around NGA? What uh, are they and, doing? For the record, uh, our friends at Quick Trip are not getting a tax break. At least they that's said they're not going to seek it. That's not but on the subject of gas, of gas stations, Wendy Weiss. Um, we've had a lot of car thefts recently. I mean, two of my colleagues at KMOX, one here at 9PBS, one of our sponsors came in, all, all left last month, they've had their car stolen. And it turns out in the second district, which is the southwest part of St. Louis, yep. there have been a ton of cars, 17 since July, that's a ton, stolen, right? A lot of the people have been pumping gas, but their fob, their key fob, or their keys are still in the car. What do you make of that? Um... I, I think that we have to be, we have to be so very careful today in terms of technology. When when I hear, and obviously these people, they're victims of crime, um, but I have less sympathy for victims of crime who leave their keys in their car in 2021. I think that that's almost like a charitable donation. I mean, I, I really think you're you're making a gift. <laughs> To, to this person. You should just put a sign in your car that says, for whatever reason, I had a brain cramp and I've left my keys in the car. Please enjoy it and return it with a full tank and of gas. And it's dishonesty. I, I'm with her. I mean, like, you, you know, police reports to, you know, the bank and says, like, we were robbed. So what happened? Said, I, well, we left a stack of cash out here, but <laughs> like, uh, where you fill out your thing. <laughs> yeah. And somebody had the nerve to take to it. To take right? it. <laughs> Imagine that in 2021. I'm sorry. If I put a dollar in the collection plate at church and it's not a check, and if someone takes the dollar, that's still, that's theft, right? Even though I made it very easy for someone to take it. I, what I'm is that? That's, like, that's no, kind of a think, different. Yeah, that's kind of That's different. kind of an apples and oranges like, you know, comparison. If my car Somebody gets stolen, I don't think God is offended. It's, you know, it's, I'm, no, I'm, but if I mean, if I leave, if I leave my, if I continuously, if I leave my credit card somewhere, and then I scream foul when somebody uses my credit card. If I lose my wallet, no, 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 if I lose my wallet still, in the middle of the street, okay, and yeah. then I found out somebody took the cash. All right, or maybe even used a credit card. I was like, You're like that that's was, on that me. Was, that's, it's was that's wrong. Wait, wait, wait. It's still a stolen car. Come right. Well, yeah, it's a stolen <laughs> car, but stolen you are car. sort of an accessory. Well, I mean, You're well, an accessory. I mean, it, you're not quite, you know, there's there's like and charities you them. can donate your car to. This isn't quite that, okay? If, if it came, I mean, wait, now if it came down to trial, if somebody actually went to trial for this, and the whole thing was like, I left my fob in, or I left my car running while I went in and they took my car, the, it'd be different if somebody smashed your window and hot wired no, it. The yeah, judge would say like, okay, both are stealing, you get to like just go about your gotcha. merry way. We've right. got the two minute warning, and right. in that those two minutes, Ray, I want to ask you about a plan, such as it is, from a consultant working for Explore St. Louis, our convention bureau, that says that the recreational facility for North County that we've all been talking about that might be built with money from the hotel motel tax could be a 200 meter banked indoor track to lure tourists to St. Louis and it'll be in North County. Uh, you were on the tourism board 40 years ago. What do you think? Uh, I was in a state, but 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 in the county. In the, the bottom line is this: we have to we have to expand the convention center if we're going to have be a major met, major metropolitan area. We have to do that. Hazel Irby, rest her soul, had a great, did a great thing by assuring there'd be a fund for a North, a North County facility. It's it's set up, but unfortunately, there's not much money in it because the pandemic. And they need to pursue as a priority getting it built. The only thing I'll say about the North County facility is the CVC are the last people you ought to have built it. And the thing you got to understand is it's got to have a convention. It's got to have a tourism purpose or you can't use those funds for it. So whatever the purpose is, is fine with me. It has to be more than just a rec center. Oh, I, Ray, it I, has I, to have a purpose. You can't, I, I, you can't I, use I, those I, monies I, for I it. I disagree with you. And I, I think that it, it looks like Kitty Radcliffe kind of snookered Hazel Irby. Because no, Hazel Irby wasn't thinking that what, what we're going to have instead of a North County recreation complex is a 
track. She wasn't. No, yeah, she I agree with that. I mean, you right. know, they, she I don't was expecting it. more. I well, think. maybe it'll I, have a track, but also some basketball courts on the side, some mats, some. You uh, have to have a tourism, tourism draw no, to use tourism money. like ones in, in yeah. Kirkwood and Frontenac right. and all these other places. Richmond it's supposed Heights. to be Richmond Heights. Yeah. It's supposed to be that. With and a lazy river. You have to have a tourism purpose to use tourism money. You do Okay, time to go. We'll pick it up here in the weeks to come. I'm sure that. We'll be discussing this further in the future. First, let's go to the letters and see what people had to say about last week's show. Ray Hartman has it exactly right when he says visitors to the St. Louis Zoo should be charged. Though St. Louis and St. Louis County residents would still get in for free. By comparison, the San Diego Zoo charges $62 for adults, $52 for those under 12. That from Tom Sullivan. Thanks, Tom. Yay, Alvin. I loved your comment of the zoo being St. Louis's gift to the world. Keep it free. So we're broadly known for the spectacular community we are. That from Gail Hen McHenry. Thanks, Gail. Jacqueline Jones, RN, wrote, Nurses are leaving bedside because, one, our pay is not increased in years. Two, we're given too many patients. Three, no hazard pay. I could go on and on. We need to unionize. And Mary Haywood wrote about our set. So stark and cold. Please change this. <laughs> it's awful. So hard on the eyes. Hope this is only temporary. Thank you, Mary. It is. You can write us care of 9 PBS, 3655 Olive Street, St. Louis, Missouri, 63108. Don't forget those emails, Donnybrook at 9pbs.org, and those tweets, hashtag DonnybrookSTL. Follow us on your podcast. I did that a couple of weeks ago. Elvin, you did a great job moderating. I was in Chicago listening to you. I think it was on Spotify. It might have been Apple, TuneIn, or Google Play. You all did a great job. Bill, you weren't on that broadcast, but you were back last week and did another outstanding performance. You <laughs> award-winning journalist. In a moment, Ness Sandoval is going to be with us from St. Louis University. We're going to talk about the population of the St. Louis area. That's next. Donnie Brook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS. Well, we were talking about our friends at St. Louis University in the first half of the show, and Alvin and I will continue the discussion somewhat, but this time with the Associate Director of the School's Geospatial Institute and a professor in the Sociology Department, Ness Sandoval, is a demographer who has been taking a look at the census trends, not only for the St. Louis area, but also for the state of Missouri. Ness Sandoval, thanks for joining us on Next Up. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for inviting me. Well, the numbers for our region are really not that good, are they? Um, the nation grew at 9% according to the census yes. in the last 10 years, but the St. Louis area grew at about 1%. Yes. So we're about 8 percentage points lagging. And right now we're the 21st biggest metro area. Where do you think we're going to be in the next 10 years? Well, I think it depends. <clears throat> I think it depends if we decide to take a laissez-faire attitude and not be proactive and thinking about what opportunities we can embrace as a region to encourage people to move to St. Louis. If we decide to take a loss pay attitude, we're gonna fall uh, from 21st, maybe to 25th, uh, mm -hmm. because we have some regions that are growing fairly fast um, based on dem demographic transitions that are smaller than St. Louis, but they're in place to surpass St. Louis within the next decade. Orlando and Charlotte being the top two regions that will probably um, surpass St. Louis uh, if we don't do anything proactively. 
of this population that we, we, we're talking about. Now, does that include, because obviously in the census, it's in another state, but are we including the, the Metro East area? Absolutely. Okay. So of our areas, and I know that St. Louis has got the, uh, the smaller population, the Metro East or St. Louis County, but who is the, where is the real problem at if, problem at if that's the way to kind of phrase it? Where do we need an influx of people because we just don't have enough people? I think you need it for the entire region. Okay. I, but right. I do think that the counties in the, on the Illinois side, um, they're a little bit older, um, and so we, we do not have as many babies. And so if you would say there's a weakness or an mm -hmm. opportunity, I, I tend to view it as an opportunity, it is building on the Illinois side of, of trying to encourage more people to come in. I'll say this, though. When we look at uh, the census and we can look at births and deaths, we should have grown faster. We should have grown by at least 75,000 people, simply from births. And so the fact that we only grew by about 32,000 kind of is an indicator that some people were leaving. Uh, and we now know, because we got some more detailed data, that we have families who are leaving, uh, white families and African-American families um, who have left the region. And so this is something that we should keep an eye on because we don't want that trend to continue over the next decade. Um, this, this, this could be a big hurdle for the region if we start to see large numbers of African-American families leave the region. Hmm. Um, some of our counties are doing reasonably well. Franklin County, Warren County, St. Charles County. So the, on, on paper, they're doing good. Um, but when you start to look at the nuance, I would, I would say a lot of the growth is actually internal migration. Hmm. So we see people leaving the city, moving out to St. Louis County, and we see a lot of people from St. Louis County moving out to St. Charles County. And we see some people from St. Charles County moving out uh, to other counties. So a lot of, a lot of the, the growth we're seeing is a little bit misleading because it's internal migration. Uh, and so we're just getting people moving from county to county. So it's not like you have people moving to St. Charles or to Warren County from uh, Nashville or Boston or... Not at the net level. Yeah, yeah. We, we saw an increase of about 32,000 net. And so that's, that's not enough. I mean, St. Louis County saw an increase, but it was a really small increase. Uh, and so if you go back even 10 years before 2000, there were still more people in St. Louis County than today. And so we, I think we have to recognize that um, we were one of the slowest growing regions of the top 50 in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, I don't think we want to be in that, that profile in the next 10 years. So that leads to something I wanted to ask you. When we talk about um, the population of St. Louis County and St. Louis City, and it's like, well, St. Charles is benefiting because everybody's moving there or whatever. Isn't it true that actually people that live west of what our region, we actually do move into our region? And so that helps like kind of bolster St. Charles's claim that everybody's moving here, that there are people that you know, from Boone County or whatever that actually move into our region? I, I think you, I think part of the growth that we see in St. Charles, and we're going to get more data when it, it's released, mm -hmm. will probably show that a lot of the growth in St. Charles County came from St. Louis County. Okay. I think that's what it's, I think that's going to be the overall conclusion. Yeah, we do have people from Chicago, from Indianapolis who are moving to the region. We also have people who are leaving St. Mm -hmm. Louis, moving to Houston, moving to Atlanta. And so when we look at the net effect, um, we can see that St. Louis County is missing a lot of white residents. And it so happened that St. Charles County saw a lot of white residents increase. Okay. And part of it is, um, as, as people are trying to live the American dream, part of that American dream is to buy a house. And St. Charles County, it, it's still more affordable, affordable than it is in St. Louis County. And so you do see um, people who want who want the American dream, it's Jefferson County and St. Charles County where it's still realistic for a lot of young families. For most major American cities, Mexican Americans represent the largest group of people who are born outside the United States and are living in those metro areas. But that's not the case in St. Louis. What immigrant group represents the largest influx of immigrants in our area? So this is actually a very, uh, I think it's a good story for St. Louis because it's not all bad news. Um, so it is true that in, in every, almost every American metropolitan region, 
the Mexican foreign-born is the largest foreign-born population. And that was true for the St. Louis metropolitan region. But about seven years ago, we started to see some trends that said if the trends continue, uh, the Mexican foreign-born would not be the largest. And it just so happened about three years ago, it got within the range where the Indian foreign-born population um, was statistically tied with the Mexican foreign-born population. And the latest data we have now is that it's no longer a statistical tie. The foreign-born Indian population is significantly larger than the Mexican foreign-born population. And what's interesting about this trend is that it's happening in St. Louis County. And so when we look at, we look at the municipalities in St. Louis County, we start to see some really interesting uh, trends. So, for example, Chesterfield now has the fourth largest immigrant population in the state of Missouri. Wow. Mm. That's, that's pretty amazing. Um, Maryland Heights, it's got one of the largest immigrant populations in the state of Missouri. And so when we start to see who's driving this population, it's the Indian foreign-born population that's living in that 270 corridor. If I could jump in here, who has uh, more, w which county has more Latinos? St. Charles or the city of St. Louis? St. Charles. St. Charles has surpassed the city of St. Louis in terms of the, the largest Latino population. It's still St. Louis County, mm -hmm. but St. Charles County second. And I think it just represents the larger demographic pattern for the region is that the majority of the growth has occurred outside the city of St. Louis, right? The city experienced a decline. Uh, but when we look at the foreign-born population, we look at the Latino population, the Asian population, the growth is occurring outside uh, the city boundaries. I, I say this half jokingly and half serious. Does Chesterfield know that they are for the <laughs> Well, I know population. I try to promote it. You know, Chesterfield, Maryland Heights, Town and Country, these are now officially immigrant destinations. Okay. Um, Clayton is on the verge of becoming an immigrant destination. Olivet is on the verge of becoming an immigrant destination. Wildwood is on the verge of becoming an immigrant destination. And so these, this is an important uh, benchmark because we don't have a very large immigrant population. But in these municipalities, huh. you're getting significant concentration of immigrants. Um, and so a lot of people are surprised, like, tell the country is an immigrant destination. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, it's reached the level of the percent of the population where it's greater than the percent of the foreign born for the US. Hmm. And a lot of these immigrants to places like Creve Corps, town and country, Clayton, Chesterfield, are pretty well educated. Yeah, so this is, an, the immigrant population in the St. Louis metropolitan region is a little, it's, it's different than we would find in Kansas City and Chicago. That it tends to be higher economic um, standing, higher educational achievement. Um, so we, we're getting a, a, a different profile of immigrants who are coming to the region uh, compared to other metropolitan regions. And so I think, I think this is going to continue to, to um, the trend's going to continue. I think the implication, though, for St. Louis is that if you want to grow the way some of the other metropolitan regions are growing, you need the Mexican foreign-born population yeah. to grow. Because when I mean, you look at Charlotte, you look at Nashville, they're growing exponentially because it's the Mexican foreign-born, not just the Mexican foreign-born, it's the Mexican-Americans as well that are moving to these regions. So it, it's, a, it's a very nice and a very positive story, what's happening in the 270 corridor. But if we were to think, if we, if we want to reimagine ourselves as a top 20 metropolitan region, we have to remember that part of that discussion has to be, we have to keep our black families in the St. Louis metropolitan region. We need to keep our white families in the St. Louis. But we have to start increasing in absolute numbers the Latino and Asian population because that's what's happening at the national level. Uh, the census kind of concluded this, this latest one as we get these numbers that um, the nation is becoming more diverse. Yes. Is the St. Louis area becoming more diverse as well? It, um, empirically, it's becoming more diverse. It's, yeah, so on, on paper, it is more diverse. 100% mm -hmm. uh, of the population growth came from racial minorities. Uh, and so the, 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 the absolute growth, we were seeing it become more diverse. But the growth was very small in terms of absolute numbers. Okay. And so uh, we're in the right, we have the right profile of, of what's happening at the national level. We just need the numbers to be bigger. So instead of 32,000 net gain, we need 500,000, 750,000 right. net gain to really see that demographic momentum push St. Louis back into the top 20 metro regions. Professor, why do um, Mexican Americans seem not to want to come to St. Louis? 
I think what there's part of it, I think part of it is historical that, that Kansas City became um, one of the gateways to Chicago and, and it was not St. Louis. And so once you establish these, mm. um, these patterns, uh, they tend to be important cities. And so St. Louis just was not part of that, part of this transition to get to Chicago, it was Kansas City. Uh, but I think now, I think it's a good question of why, why St. Louis, although we did experience growth, we're not seeing the growth that Nashville's seen. We're not seeing the growth that um, Charlotte's seen. And these are not cities that were traditional gateway cities for the Mexican population. And so I think there is a perception, rightly or wrongly, that because St. Louis is in Missouri, I believe there is a perception that Missouri does not welcome um, hmm. Mexican Im immigrants. And precisely, and you, if you look at a lot of the rhetoric, um, I, I think you could say that that's probably a fair conclusion. And we have seen over the past 10 years, whenever there's very, um, when there's bills that are introduced in Jefferson City that have a, a certain type of rhetoric, we see a decline. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Kansas City is in Missouri. Obviously, Kansas is there where some great people went to college, <laughs> like myself. But so I was going to say, so is it, it's, it's more attitude than latitude or longitude that for some reason, Kansas City, let's go there and then maybe go someplace else or stay. Well, an interesting right. point about mm -hmm. that, though, the Mexican immigrants live on the Kansas side. Okay, all right. Not on the Missouri side all right. of the mm -hmm. city. How about Haitians? Um, how about Afghanis? Is it possible to attract uh, a significant, maybe more than a thousand here, a thousand there? Is it possible really to welcome these individuals into our area? Anything's possible, but these are these are still small numbers. Yeah, right? a thousand here, a thousand there. These, these are not the numbers that we're seeing in Houston, Texas. We're seeing in Phoenix. We're seeing in Atlanta. We're talking thirty thousand, forty thousand um, people moving in, and so every every number helps. Um, but when we, if we want to stay a major metropolitan region, top 25, top top 20, we need major changes in our demographic profile of the region. How, well, how do you do that? I mean, there are no TV commercials that kind of say you're welcome to come to St. Louis, no matter who you are. I don't think too many regions have those. How do you how do you address it? If you say like, okay, we have to come up with some kind of strategy to do this, how do we do that? You have to reach the younger population. Okay. So when you look at the when you look at the demographic trends, part of where we look at are age, sex, cohorts, and and I'm just going to show a couple of demographic facts that really get us thinking about this. In um, Houston, Texas, more babies will be born in Houston than the entire state of Missouri. Oh wow! In, in a year? In one year. One year. Okay. There are more children in Los Angeles MSA that are Latino under five than the entire state of Missouri, this one Latinos. So you gotta, these are the young people. This is, these are very young people who are not gonna stay in Los Angeles. They're not gonna stay in Houston. They're gonna, they're gonna be leaving, many of them are gonna be leaving. And so we have to reach this population and get a sense, can they imagine themselves living in St. Louis, right? Because when you, when you talk to young children, uh, that I wanna go to Los Angeles, I wanna go to Miami. Mm -hmm. Because in their mind, they can see what life is like in these cities. I've yet to meet young people who say that they want to make their life in St. Louis. Uh, or they, I, I, don't, I don't see people saying that they, they come to St. Louis because there's a job. But how many young people come to St. Louis because they imagine what the city's like and then they find a job later? Now, are you talking about immigrant children or I'm all talking, children? I'm talking all children. All children. I'm talking any child under five today, we have to reach them and say, St. Louis, Missouri. Are you saying under five? Under five, right? How, because how, how would a metropolitan area try and reach a four-year-old? Well, okay, I'm, I'm being very, I'm being very utopian here, right? You have to, you have to go out and promote your city. You have to promote the region, and you have to put it in these children's mind that life in Missouri is great, life in St. Louis is great. You can live the American dream, and it's not simply about cost of living. I, I hear this a lot, and there are lots of places that are cheaper to live in St. Louis, and people are not going there because people want diversity. They, they want to see and consume a certain type of American life. And if you don't have it in your city, they're going to go to other cities. This is why Miami captures a lot of imagination, because Miami is a very diverse city. This is why we look at Houston, Texas. 
Houston, I think people don't understand what's happening in Houston, Texas. It is, the demographic transitions in Texas are, in Houston are amazing, Dallas. Uh, these, these regions are growing and people are gonna be leaving. The question for us as a region, are we gonna let them go to Nashville or are we gonna fight and say, come to St. Louis, come to Missouri and think about um, having a life here. Yeah, come on, Charlie. Now, when we were young, you remember, I love New York. I had never been to New York. Remember Virginia's Lovers? You always said, like, what is that about? So, like, people who live in Virginia love the place. You know, he's got... So, I, I hear what you're saying, to make an effort to make younger people just kind of say, like, Missouri, St. Louis. What's that about? Because that's fascinating commercial. Yeah. Or that's something that I never thought of, other than the Cardinals, because everybody knows that. So, it's doable. You think that's well. doable? Yeah, I, I think like people our age, we're going to move because of jobs. Mm -hmm. But young people who are going to move are going to move because of an imagination, of a dream. And I would say right now, nobody's dreaming about coming to St. Louis when they're leaving Dallas or Houston. They're dreaming about, I want to go to Orlando, I want to mm -hmm. go to Miami, I want to go to Atlanta, Washington, D.C. That, that could be true. I just think that positioning the city to a four-year-old is a little young. I mean, if you said 18 to 22-year-olds, you know, people who are in college, when they're thinking about where they might want to move to, let's say, after St. Louis University, which is kind of our challenge. How do we make sure that the graduates from Wash U and Webster and St. Louis University and Fon Fon, after that last commencement speech at the, you know, graduation exercises, how do we make sure they stay here and not head with the family to Lambert and go to Austin, Boston, Nashville, or Columbus, Ohio? Well, this is the challenge. I, I, every, every year we have students uh, that we try to keep here in St. Louis, but they're being actively recruited to go to San Francisco, to Seattle, uh, because they have talent. And so we're, we're in competition. St. Louis is in competition to keep our talent here with other cities who are growing need that talent. And so I think we have to, um, Part of it is good paying jobs, uh, but I think part of it's also um, trying to have students recognize that there is a life here in St. Louis. There is a, a, a sense of diversity that, that they can have here. I think one of the challenges for St. Louis that these other cities that are emerging don't have is we still have inequality within the city and in the suburbs. And so the type of spatial inequality we see in St. Louis does, does not really exist in Nashville. There's inequality there, but not at the magnitude we've seen, we see here in the city and the suburbs. And so this is one of the challenges when people come, they're like, I want, I want Nashville, because Nashville is more, on, when you, go, you drive through Nashville and you walk through the city, you don't see these stark changes in the built environment. But this happened over many decades, right, in the city. And I think what, unfortunately, what happened in St. Louis, as, this, as the region grew, um, the segregation within the city moved out to the suburbs. And this, this is fairly unique because in most American cities, suburbs have meant integration. But in St. Louis, suburbs have meant separation. And now the majority of racial segregation is actually in the suburbs and not in the city. I know it's hard to believe, uh, but the city's actually more racially integrated mm -hmm. than our suburbs. That, you will not find that in Denver. You will not find that in Houston you will not find that in Austin. The suburbs have meant living the American dream regardless of your racial characteristics. Okay, our largest minority still, I would obviously assume, in our area is African American, black people. Yeah. Okay, it's going back decades. Yeah. Our thought, those of us that were going to college, surefire, gonna have careers where journalism, engineering, was to get out of here, okay? And we went to college elsewhere, and we may have come back, but it was a lot of years later, and I still feel that that's still true, that most of us left. And I still think most of us don't come back. And like I was 35, you know, when I came back and really wasn't an intention of staying here, except we had two daughters kind of later in life. So um, how, how, how do you stop that? I mean, just, and I can't tell, no. and, and this is the truth, I can't tell a black kid that's going to go away and go to college and say, like, I'm kind of done with St. Louis. I said, like, well, I did the same thing. So how do we stop that? It's hard. I mean, this, it's, it's, I think it's having to go back and saying, what, what is, what's the dream that you can live in St. Louis? This is not simply a St. Louis 
challenge. Mm -hmm. It's happening in Chicago, mm -hmm. it's happening in Detroit, in Milwaukee, where we are seeing significant numbers of black families move to the South, especially Atlanta, Orlando, Houston, and Washington, D.C. What the work, the research shows is that the opportunities that are, are a lot greater there in these cities um, because they're more diverse uh, and there's the structural um, discriminations don't really exist to the level they do here in the region. It's, it's difficult. I think you have to, you have to, the, these are challenges we have, as a region have to confront mm -hmm. that um, if, if we're not going to deal with the inequality within our built environment, it's hard to tell people to stay in your neighborhood when they can move to Denver or move to Austin and have a completely different metropolitan opportunity structure for their children, for their families, where they, they get just a different a different sense of what that American dream can be about. What about um, our area is affordable and it's a great place to raise kids? It is affordable. Um, but the young generation, that's one of many characteristics that they look at when they look at cities, is affordability. They're, they're looking for diversity. What, what, they think of creativity. What motivates creativity is interacting with different people, uh, going to different types of restaurants, different types of cultural and sporting events. So this, the younger generation is motivated by many different factors, and one of them is uh, cost of living. Now, we're more sensitive at our age um, to cost of living, but if you're 21, 22, uh, I know when, I, when I moved, I'm like, I'm going to Washington, D.C., and I don't care how expensive it is because I want that cultural life of Washington, D.C. Sure. And I think we don't, we don't offer that type of cultural life that D.C. offers, and I would even say it's true for Atlanta. Atlanta, a lot of people like Atlanta because of what Atlanta has to offer. Phoenix, Houston, Dallas, they've all built a metropolitan opportunity structure where people see that they can have access to it. Well, you know, I've been on a few of them, you know, we call it like familiarization tours, fam tours. Do we do that in St. Louis? Do we, do we find young people, come here, check it out, this is what we've got? How do we... It, we are know. getting young people coming in from the coast. So people, people are leaving Boston, people are leaving New York, they're leaving San Francisco because those are very expensive cities. So we are seeing some young white uh, families coming into um, the region. But we're also seeing families leave. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so this in, in demography, it's it's not simply getting people to come in. You you got to once they're here, you got to keep them here. Mm -hmm. And so your population changes when people are out migrating. And the the census released the database a couple weeks ago, and it showed that we were still losing people. People are. We can talk about affordability all we want. People are going to go to Atlanta. They're going to go to Dallas, Houston, because those cities offer something that's different. Uh, we have less than two minutes to go. Can you give us a quick prescription of what we should do? Maybe two or three bullet points that we might consider before the next census Absolutely. is taken? Absolutely. So if we're going to grow as a region, we have to recognize that we're going to grow based on what's happening at the national level. And there are three groups that are growing, Latinos, Asians, and multiracial minorities. And the, the black population is growing, but not as fast as those. So if we're going to grow, we need to diversify with that growth. And so right now we have a population of about 106 Latinos. If we're going to be a major metropolitan region, we need to be about 300, 400,000 Latinos in the next decade. Our Asian population needs to double. We need to keep our African American and white families in the St. Louis metropolitan region. If we if we do that, we we will be competitive. We'll, we possibly can get back into the top 20. But we have these other regions, Charlotte and Orlando, who are coming fast. And their growth is driven by Latino population growth. Well, I'll tell you what, our time is up. But I was just thinking, Alvin, I hope that Dr. Sandoval stays in St. Louis because it wouldn't look too good if on some future Donnybrook we said that <laughs> Ness Sandoval has moved out of town. <laughs> but no, the numbers that you just shared right there at the end, I think that, that just needs to be out there. These are the number of people, and these are the people that we need. Pretty simple, but very intellectual. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. And hello to all the folks at uh, St. Louis University. Go Billikens. Go yeah. Billikens. All right. That's it uh, for this edition of Next Up. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week.
Donnybrook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS.